So next we want to use the squeeze theorem to determine the limits of some sequences. The idea here is to kind of choose two easy ones that converge to the same limit. So for me, looking at cosine, well, really any, any form of either sine or cosine, we know that sine and cosine, they're just oscillating they're bounded by one and negative one, right? So no matter if you're sine or cosine, you're still gonna be bounded. So for me, when I look at cosine of n, I know that the biggest that cosine can be, well, maybe I'll start like this, I'm gonna build it up. For cosine of n, for any value of n, the biggest that it can be is one and the smallest that it can be is negative one. So from here, I'll just go ahead and divide each side by one over n squared. And so this inequality holds because I divided everything by n squared. So notice that the limit as n goes to infinity of negative one over n squared equals zero. And that's also the limit as n goes to infinity of positive one over n squared. So the idea with the squeeze theorem, remember, is to pinch it in between two sequences that have the same limit. You have to have them with the same limit, otherwise this doesn't work. So therefore, which is this symbol here, Therefore, the limit of cosine of n over n squared also must equal zero. And you can do the exact same thing with b. We have negative one over two, and that whole thing is going, uh, is being raised to the nth power. So this thing's flip-flopping between positive and negative. So if it's always positive, I can bound it above by one half over n, right? The like totally positive version of it. And I can bound it below by the negative version of it. Right, so on the left side, it's always negative. On the right side, it's always positive. And in the middle, it's just flip-flopping between positive and negative. And in that way, I'll keep it bound between these two things. So this limit equals zero, right? So a half, negative one half, negative one fourth, negative one eighth, negative one sixteenth. So that denominator just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So this limit goes to zero. Um, similarly, one half to the n goes to zero. So we just use the squeeze theorem, right? So we got it all set up. We showed the inequality is true. We showed that the limits are the same. So then we conclude that the limit as n goes to infinity of negative one over two to the n also equals zero. Um, so we have this idea of what it means to be a bounded sequence. It's very straightforward. It just means that there's some sort of like upper threshold that the sequence will not surpass. Similarly, there's a it's bounded below if there's a lower threshold that the sequence does not surpass. So for example, you know, your sequence is all of these dots, like so let's say this thing just is like going off the page, but it's still bounded below, right? Like, so none of the, none of the values in the sequence are ever going to be less than this M here. That's a lower bound, or we could say the sequence is bounded below. Similarly, you would have a situation for bounded above. If it's bounded above and below, we just call it bounded. Um, and then, 
the reason we bring up this definition is because we want to say something like, if a sequence converges, then it's bounded. I'll let you think of some fun counterexamples to that. We also have the idea of increasing and decreasing. So increasing and decreasing just is exactly what you think it is. Your increasing means that you're getting bigger at the further along you go out in your sequence. Decreasing means you're getting smaller as you go further along in your sequence. Notice that it's not a strict inequality, it's greater than or equal to. So for example, the sequence one, 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 is technically increasing and it's also technically decreasing. So that's kind of like a fun little fact that happens with your greater than or equal to. So for example, like one, one, two, 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 three, 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 four, five, eight, eight, nine, etc. This is an increasing sequence. So allowing for repetition shouldn't preclude it from being increasing or decreasing, right? So I think that's why this greater than or equal to exists in part. A monotone sequence is a sequence that is either increasing or decreasing. Here's a sequence that's neither increasing nor decreasing. So, because it's just oscillating back and forth, right? Next, we have the monotone convergence theorem. So if you're bounded, then that means that, after, this is such a cool theorem. If you're a bounded sequence, and just to reiterate, I wanna say something. So again, a sequence being convergent means it's bounded. It doesn't mean that a bounded sequence implies convergence. Like for example, negative one to the N is a bounded sequence. It's never gonna converge. Um, okay, sorry, I digress. So monotone convergence theorem. If A sub N is a bounded sequence, then there's some index, there's some far enough amount, amount you can go out in your list such that the sequence then from that point on is going to be monotone. So then what happens, so then what's cool, oh sorry, if there's a bounded sequence and you have a point after which it's monotone, then it's converging. So it's basically just if you're bounded and monotone, then you have to converge. Because think about this, like let's say you're bounded, okay? So here you are, here's your sequence, you get to play in this space, right? Like you can be here, you can be here, you can do whatever you want. So maybe you're just like chilling, like one, negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. And then all of a sudden you're just like, oh my God, that's so boring. So now after that, you start becoming monotone. So that means that you're either constant or you're maybe you're going up a little bit. But if you're monotone, eventually you, you can't, you can't go outside of this boundary here, right? So you have to either approach your upper limit or your lower limit, right? So in the beginning, wild child. Then after a certain point, let's call this here, N, what are they calling it in this notation? N not, okay, fine, whatever. Sometimes we write capital N. Then we know that this guy has to converge. So we want to, I'm just gonna do example A. So we wanna show that the, that A converges using its monotone convergence, using the monotone convergence theorem. So remember the monotone convergence theorem, you have to be bounded and you have to be monotone.
So this is another great example of how factorials really just annihilate all other functions that we typically see in terms of how fast it approaches infinity. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show its monotone. So that is, I want to say, well, I want to say it's either increasing or decreasing. So I kind of want to compare a n plus one versus a sub n. Is this increasing or decreasing? Well, I already know that the denominator is going to like totally blow up. So I'm going to say that this is decreasing. So what I really want to say is that a n plus one is less than or equal to a sub n for some index. And we'll determine what that index is. So a, the n plus one term, that's going to be four over n plus one over n plus one factorial. And I want to show that this is less than or equal to the nth term. So what I do from here is I'm actually going to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm going to get 1 So I'm going to get a one fourth here. So one is greater than or equal to a four survives on the bottom and on the top. So just FYI for those that are maybe a little bit rusty on this. So this is n plus one times n times n minus one times n minus two times n times two. Minus one. That's what a factorial does. And n factorial is just going to be n, n minus one, n minus two, three, two, one. So, okay, so all this stuff cancels, all this stuff cancels, all this stuff cancels, this cancels. The only thing that survives is n plus one. So this just becomes n plus one over four. So if I had n equals one, I would get a half, and this isn't true. Even with n equals two, it's still not true. So this is true only starting at three. So we've shown that it's monotone, and we determined the index after which it becomes monotonic. I think that's a word, I'm not sure. Um, so now I need to show that it's bounded. Well, I know that it's decreasing after three, and it's certainly never going to get negative. So let's look at this. So what, if we kind of just check out the, the sequence, the first few terms. So four over n, four to the n over n factorial. And let's say we start at even if we started at zero. You'd have one, four, eight, 32 over three. And then, so that's one, two, three. Three, zero, one, two, three. And then from here, then it starts decreasing. So the biggest that it's going to be is this. So this is our max. And then it's decreasing, but it's always positive. And then so our min can be zero. So I've shown that it's monotone. I've shown that it's bounded. So then what can I conclude? Looking at the monotone convergence theorem, if a, if a sequence is bounded and there exists a positive integer, n naught, which for us was three, such that a sub n becomes monotone, 
then we know A sub n converges. So here's the bounded part. And then our conclusion is that A sub n converges by the monotone convergence here, and that's it.